Yeah, so the three cell types in the alveoli. Uh, it's type what? Alveolar cell, type two, alveolar cell, alveolar macrophage.
save those for a little later so we, we can get all used to everything. Oh, and I wouldn't tell you if I do one, but I don't spend a whole lot of time on this being out of the park in the lab. I feel like it's better just to do that in the lab and actually go look at it with an animal or look at it in slides. But you can see the path air takes, goes into the nose the mouth, carries the larynx, trachea, etc. Um, one thing that I think is interesting, what do you think is bigger? The trachea or the esophagus? <coughs> you would be wrong. Uh, everybody always thinks esophagus. I think I didn't talk about it, right? You looked at it. Uh, one of the reasons is the trachea has lots of cartilage in it, so it stays the same kind of um, with the esophagus muscle, so it kind of gets squished. So when food's going down it, it's for the most part, it's pretty narrow. Um, so a lot of people get those two confused when they're looking at the animal. So if you intubate somebody, make sure you put a trachea on the esophagus. If you want extra at home review, I like to put these in here. There's just a whole bunch of uh, pictures, information. You can just click through on your own. That's provided by the, the publisher there. Um, and to get to it, you do have to be in slideshow mode, which is kind of different. If you're just looking at the PowerPoint, that link won't work. You have to push slideshow and then click on it. Um, All right, so a few things. The pharynx is divided into three regions. Uh, there's no physical barrier between the three. It's just kind of the top part is this, the middle part is this. So no surprise, the nasopharynx is close to your nose, up on the top. The oropharynx, like the oral part, and then the laryngopharynx, down by the larynx. Kind of makes sense, right? And you can see in this picture, kind of, there's the esophagus in the back here, that kind of really small right there. And then the big trachea is right next to it. So it's like four or five times bigger in width. And there's the little epiglottis. It's one of my favorite science words for some reason. Just sounds cool. All right. Um, so after the air goes through you know, the nose, the mouth, goes through the pharynx, and then it passes the epiglottis into the trachea. And then from the trachea, there is a whole bunch of branching. So it's kind of like a tree. It starts out big. And then every time it divides, those passageways become narrower and narrower. And they all have little names. So it goes trachea main bronchi, lobar bronchi, segmental bronchi, bronchioles, and terminal bronchioles. That's where the air is going through them. And of course, the reason for all this is we're trying to eventually get, um, trying to get the air spread out to the largest surface area you can. So we're eventually gonna get to the alveoli. Um, because if you just have, if you just filled up two lungs like big balloons, that's not much surface area for gas to go in and out of the blood. So instead we divide it and divide it and divide it into tiny little alveoli balloons, which we'll get to. All right. Um, so going back to 201, if you think back to, way back to chapter, chapter four, I think. Um, these passageways have different kinds of epithelium lining the structure. So up at the top, the main bronchi is pseudostratified ciliated columnar. Um, do y'all remember what all those words mean? You're lying. No. Um, what does pseudostratified mean? <laughs> it's what? Uh, you're close. It means like almost stratified or something. 
Um, so stratified would be, you know, big stacks of them. So pseudostratified is like some go all the way and some don't. Something like that. Got kind of a mixture of cells squeezed in there. So some that go to the surface and some that are kind of stacked. Obviously, what it, what ciliated me in? It's got the little hairs on it. And then columnar means they're column shaped, right? Um, there's also a bunch of mucus producing cells in there. So you might remember what kind of cells make mucus. Wait, you probably never learned that. Uh, not so much the shape, there's a special name for them. They're called goblet cells. Um, you'll see them in respiratory, you'll see them in the um, digestive system, and the immune system. So they make mucus. So we've got a little special goblet cell here. What color should mucus be? Green? So it's putting out some mucus here, which will be important in a second. Um, it doesn't have much smooth muscle. And that's because your, your bronchi, they don't change size in response to anything. They just kind of stay open, sort of like the trachea. And then if you compare that to the terminal bronchial, so we're like, Comparing this one to the very end of the conducting zone. And then the ones in between sort of slowly change. Um, there's a whole table in your book, but I figure I just pick out two rather than make you tell me all of them. So down at the end, it becomes ciliated, um, non ciliated simple. There's no mucus cells and there's lots of smooth muscle. Um, why do you think they have lots of smooth muscle, do you think? Uh, change, not quite change the gas pressure. You're almost there, though. Um, so basically, yeah, you're changing how much air gets to the alveoli for gas exchange. Um, and so, like in asthma, for example, these are the passageways that get so narrowed that you can't breathe. It's down here at the bronchial level. Um, during exercise, what do you think happens to those bronchioles? So that smooth muscle will relax and it'll let more air down to the alveoli. So that's where you kind of change the amount of air that's getting in there. All right. Um, all right, so uh, those cilia, mainly in the bronchi, uh, the bronchus before you get to the bronchioles. Obviously, you're inhaling an enormous amount of air. If you like added up all your breaths over an hour or something, uh, do you think there might be some foreign particles in that air you're breathing? Do you think there's a lot of them? It's probably like an enormous amount of stuff going in there. So we need lots of defenses, um, and it's pretty much non-specific just like physical protection. Um, so you can think of the mucus. Um, it's just a sticky substance that catches anything that's kind of in the air. And then you have the cilia that take that mucus with anything it traps, and the cilia only beat upwards. So all the way back, you know, down here in the um, bigger, bronchioles in the lungs and in the bronchus, it's all beating upwards, beating upwards. Um, so it brings things back here and then you kind of feel it and then the coughing is like a little extra to get it the last, the last part. Yeah, I don't know exactly what triggers coughing. I'm sure it's like back here in the brain, like an involuntary um, reaction. But yeah, the cilia help get it up, um, and if you have too much, then that triggers that cough reflex. Um, so it's coming right up through that epiglottis, back there into the back of your throat. As you know, when you're sick, you've got all that um, mucus, mostly coming from your nose, but also coming up as well. 
We'll see how many times we can say mucus today. What was that, like five, six? Let's see if I make it to 20, <laughs> would be the goal. Um, you do have like actual hairs in your nasal cavity that catch it, not cilia, but real hairs. <clears throat> so it goes through like that first you know, macro filtration before it gets into the cilia. And then anything that happens to get through all that, you've got those macrophages in the alveoli to eat anything for and it gets down there. Um, and you can imagine, you know, as they always try to, if you get some kind of respiratory infection, what's the worst thing that can happen? It gets all the way down into the alveoli. You know, it's not as bad if it's just in the nose. And then maybe you get bronchitis, which means, where do you think it is in bronchitis? Like in the bronchioles or in the bronchus, and then it can get all the way deeper into there. Um, tuberculosis, which you've heard of, that actually lives um, more or less forever in your alveoli, which is why it's so, such a bad one to have, especially without antibiotics or if it's resistant. All right, and I've got a nice picture of the mucus or the mucociliary escalator, as they call it. So it is an escalator and it has mucus and cilia involved. Um, while it's loading, do you have any questions so far? <coughs> um, I was tell you, I was teaching in patho yesterday, those cilia, ciliated cells in the trachea and the bronchus, they're actually killed by smoking and replaced by non-ciliated cells. Um, so, uh, you know, what do people who smoke have? That smoker's cough. It's like sort of persistent, right? That's because that mucus doesn't really, isn't being swept out by the cilia. It just kind of sits in there. So you always have to cough it up. Uh, COPD is a little bit different. It's worse, yeah. definitely, than that. The air we breathe contains foreign matter such as dust, bacteria, and pollen. Air-like cells called cilia, as well as goblet cells, can be found in the lining of the respiratory tract called the respiratory epithelium. Goblet cells secrete viscous mucus that forms a layer to trap foreign material. The wave-like action of the underlying cilia mobilizes the mucus layer, removing the foreign matter and preventing it from entering the lungs. There you go. So it's like a little, little waves in the mucus. All right, so which of these is true when comparing the main bronchi with the terminal bronchioles? Oh, and for anyone who wasn't in Tuan, the way I do these questions is it's always on your own first, and then you vote, and then if there's disagreement or if everybody's wrong, then I'll have you talk to your group about it. All right, so in this case, um, three quarters of you are correct, so we don't need to talk about it, or have you talk to your group about it. Um, so it's different types of epithelial tissue and their function is different. Um, I really thought I'd catch you with these two and get you to put F, but you're too smart for me, so. I have to come up with a harder question next time. Um, and it's different amounts of, do they have different amounts of some kind of muscle? It turns a smooth muscle, exactly. Um, and why isn't the terminal bronchial part of the mucociliary escalator? Yeah, there's no cilia. Is there mucus? Um, so of course, I mean, if you don't have cilia, what would happen if you made mucus down there? Where would it go? Yeah, it would just kind of sit there or drip down to the alveoli. Um, so you don't make any mucus down that far. Yes? Uh, well, it might contribute, um, but mucus itself isn't like an infection. Um, but yeah, during pneumonia, um, you know, you've got bacteria or viruses growing down there. So then you have the other immune cells coming in and making mucus to lower down, which is why when you have pneumonia, how do you get that mucus out? You're like coughing all the time. Um, 
And I've even heard of people like cracking, like breaking ribs from coughing so hard. Sounds pretty terrible. Um, so if it's pink and frothy, what do you think's in there? Uh, the blood, um, and that's because you've got um, that inflammation process down in the alveoli. So the capillaries become more permeable and you're getting red blood cells actually leaving the capillaries and getting into the alveoli and coming up with like the, um, the mucus and everything else. So it's not good, but I mean, it's, does that happen? That doesn't happen all the time if you have pneumonia though, right? It's like if it's bad. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, it's pronounced po pneumonia though. It's not. It's not. <laughs> All right, so we've got a few questions for you to work on with your group. Which are here. Oh, and I do print out the assignments for you. I just post them in case you need them later or lose them or something. I don't know if anyone noticed they're posted up there. Okay. All right, so questions one and two. Uh, there's quite a lot of words to put in order there on the first one. Oh, and for these two, I want you to do it without looking at any notes or anything. You just have to talk to your group about it. So I bet you can figure it out. All right, so um, little hints on question two there. Um, you should probably have, be saying something about, it has this structure because it does this. Um, when you see a question like structure determining function or something, that's what you're kind of getting at. Should be some kind of because in there. All right, so uh, nice work on that one. Um, that question you just answered is what I meant to write down for study guide item I on there. So I will send you an email too if I remember. But instead of explain how the structure of the respiratory membrane supports its function, we should replace it with this one. And you just answered it on that. That's question two on the worksheet. So you don't have to memorize this whole table or anything, but just wanted to point out because I like uh, how it's organized. Um, and so you don't, if you look here, it's kind of interesting. This is going from like largest diameter all the way down to the alveoli. Um, and as you go down, do you stop making cilia or stop making mucus first? Makes sense, right? Because you stop making mucus here, and then you have cilia one level below. So the mucus you make here gets brushed back up. Um, and no mucus and cilia down below. Um, and these first, what is that? Six parts are what this is the conducting zone. And then once you get to the respiratory bronchioles, the ducts and alveoli, that's where respiratory or respiration happens. So that's the respiratory zone. It's kind of highlighted in that table. Um, so table 23, one, it's got lots of, it's a well-organized table. It kind of shows it all in one place. It's kind of nice. Um, and it even tells you what kind of epithelium is in each place as well. And the function of that area. Great. So let's talk about the respiratory zone then. So that consists of the smallest bronchioles, the ducts, and the alveoli themselves. All right, so uh, would you say that the conducting zone is the same? It's the same structures as the upper respiratory system. Whoa, perfect. All right, so why don't you chat with your group? We got 50 50. I mean, it's a good one. All 
All right, uh, let's get another vote. Maybe someone in your group changed their mind. Uh, go ahead and vote again. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I always think y'all have already done two of one This will be the same like procedure for all the questions. Um, and so that way when you're done talking to your group, you vote, and then I know that you're done talking about science, and then you're talking about whatever else. <laughs> all right. So we had a slight shift towards uh, B, um, and B is the correct answer. It is false because um, where does the upper respiratory system stop? The epiglottis, so like the larynx and below. Um, where does the conducting zone stop? Yeah, so way down in the lungs. Um, so they're they're not the same. They're not synonymous. Even though it just it seems like they should be, right? Like just in your mind, you're like of course they're the same, um, but they're not at all. All right, so uh, what's the final part of the conducting zone? You probably just talked about it in your group, I'm guessing. <laughs> All right, so 82% D, and you're right. It's the terminal bronchial is the end of the conducting zone. Right. Um, so as I mentioned before, you're just trying to get to the greatest surface area you can. Um, and so uh, the way to do that is to have at the very end where respiration happens, is to have a whole bunch of tiny little sacs called exactly just like a bunch of grapes at the end. Um, so I wish I remembered the thing. Um, the total surface area of your lungs is something like bigger than this room, which is kind of hard to imagine. You kind of took all those little grapes and spread them out on the floor. You'd have like multiple rooms wide. Um, and that's because, I mean, diffusion isn't that efficient. And we use lots of oxygen. We need lots of oxygen. So you have, um, need a whole lot of surface area for this stuff to happen. Um, all right, so that's what it looks like in a diagram. Um, we'll be looking at it in the microscope next week. And when you look at the lung, what do you see? Like, what is it mostly? It's like hollow almost, right? It's like mostly white space. That's because most of your lung is hollow alveoli. Unless you have tuberculosis or um, emphysema, the alveoli actually start collapsing and you see big like holes in there instead of nice little sacs. Um, we'll talk about that in patho eventually. And then you can kind of see the path pathways like the bronchioles and the little alveolar ducts for the air to flow through. Um, it's a little hard to tell because it's two-dimensional, right? What should be really cool is to like somehow look at it under the microscope in three dimensions. But there's no, there's no real such thing as a three-dimensional microscope. Not really. Yeah, I know. That's what somebody needs to make is like a magic school bus virtual reality for anatomy classes. They are. are they? For medical school, you like click on the bottom yeah. and like zoom in. Oh, yeah. But do you have like a virtual reality goggles you can yeah, wear? Oh, cool. you can oh, I want those. Have you all ha have you played with them before somewhere? No. Just read about oh. Yeah, I'll look this up. I'm guessing I couldn't afford them. <laughs> Maybe we can get one or two. Oh, cool. 
All right. Um, what do you notice about the walls of the alveoli? Are they um, thin or thick? Pretty thin. Um, so we're going to zoom in on one little wall of the alveoli. So get as microscopic as we can. Um, so if you zoom in on one of those little grapes, um, it's a very thin wall. There's the type 1 cell, which is simple squamous, little flat pancake. Um, there's a macrophage hanging out in there. And then this dark or light blue is a basement membrane. What kind of tissue is basement membrane? Yeah. Tissue type. It's connective. So it's like at that collagen and um, little extracellular matrix. So that kind of gives it its structure, but it's still pretty thin and narrow. And then on the other side, where is it? Let's zoom in here. Um, so right next to the alveoli is tiny capillaries. So the oxygen will go through the type 1 cell, through the basement membrane, through the epithelial cell or endothelial cell of the blood vessel, and then into the blood cell itself. So you can kind of see one, two, three capillaries kind of wrapped around that little grape what you would be looking at. Um, there's a type 2 cell on there. Yeah, there it is. And we're going to talk about the type 2 cell in a second. But you could tell, you know, it looks completely different. It's not a squamous cell. It's a little bit different. So type 1, that's the cells that the oxygen and CO2 go through. Um, the macrophages in type 2 makes what's called a surfactant. Um, and that's basically an oily, soapy thing, which is important because these tiny little grapes, obviously it's in your body, so it's probably wet. Um, and is, what does water, what does a tiny little balloon want to do, do you think? Especially when air leaves it. So especially if it's wet, it's going to fold up on itself. Um, and if it folds up, it's not easy to reinflate it. Like think about when you start blowing up a balloon, it's like hard right at the beginning, right? Um, you're, you're not getting enough air pressure in there to do that. So very important, if you put oil, kind of coat it with this oily thing, um, it doesn't, it's not attracted to itself because oil's nonpolar, it's no hydrogen bonds. Um, so the inside of those is basically coated with oil. Right. So that's the type 2 cells that make that very important. All right, so the um, respiratory membrane is what I was kind of showing you on there. That's just the membrane between the alveoli and the capillary. Um, and it's a membrane because it's got epithelial cells and connective tissue. Remember that definition of membrane from 201? So it's epithelial cells, squamous ones on the alveoli side, two basement membranes, and then endothelial cells lining the capillary. So that's where that oxygen's going through all three layers. So the oxygen starts over here, goes through there, through there, through there, and then the CO2 starts over here, goes through that way. And what kind of respiration is that? Internal or external? It's your external. Exactly. All right, I don't like that picture as much. All right, so why do you think um, the alveoli are lined with simple squamous epithelium. All right, so I'll have you chat with your group. Um, if you do think it's E, you need to talk about which ones you think are right. So discuss. Um, you're not going to find the answer anywhere. I don't think.
What? What? Why not? I'll post, I'll, that's weird. It's really not in your PowerPoint? All right, I'll fix it. I think I uploaded it without saving it, so it didn't save my new question. All right, so uh, once you're done with that one, go and vote again. All right, anybody else? Three more people? Everybody vote again? Yeah. Where's the log in? All right. Um, so the lonely 18% is actually right. You stuck with A there. Um, so uh, a lot of these other answers sound pretty good, don't they? They do. Um, but none of them are right. So did everyone at least think A was one of the right answers? No? Uh huh. Um, so I think the difference there is, you know, the gas is in here and you've got these super narrow cells. So the diffusion, since they're squamous, they're little pancakes. Um, so for the gas to go, it only has to go through that tiny little pancake part. Um, if it was like a columnar cell, then the gas would have to go that far. That's kind of what we're getting at. Uh, and it's simple, so it's only one layer. So we had noise to go through that one little pancake. Um, so uh, is epithelium structurally strong? No epithelium is structurally strong, so that really is not right. Um, it has many layers. Does it have lots of layers? No, it's simple. It's only one layer. It's simple. Um, can it change shape to modify how fast respiration, respiration happens? No. What's the only kind of epithelium that changes shape? Well, it's called transitional epithelium. Um, but what changes? What changes to change? Is that right? What changes to change how fast um, respiration happens? Uh, the bronchioles, right? The terminal bronchioles. They change how big they are. Um, so the alveoli is just there. It doesn't get to change its size or anything. It's just how fast the air comes in or out. That's the bronchioles that decide. Um, and anyways, these, you know, this is one that like just wanted to get you discussing and trying to figure it on out. And I'm not trying to be mean. I just want to find out where you're stuck or where there's little misconceptions. All right. So the last thing is to talk a little bit about internal and external respiration. Um, so it's a combination of ventilation, external respiration, and internal respiration. And before we get too far in there, um, what does your body need oxygen for? Everything. Well, what do your cells need oxygen for? Everything. What? Uh, close. You're on the right track. Most people don't even get that close. Um, it's not quite the Krebs cycle. It's what happens after the Krebs cycle. Uh -huh. So the electron transport chain, which is ATP synthesis, um, and it's for energy. So if you remember, um, break down glucose, and then you need something to take care of all the electrons that you took out of it. And that's what oxygen's used for. It combines with those electrons to make water. Um, without oxygen, you can't make much ATP, and you'll die. So for example, cyanide um, blocks the electron transport chain, 
blocks oxygen from being used? How fast does cyanide kill you? Like a couple minutes, right? In those spy movies, you like take your capsule and that also is true. Um, so that's what you need oxygen for. Obviously, all of your cells make ATP and need energy. So all of your cells do internal respiration. Um, what is it you're breathing out? Where does that come from? Hold on. Shh. Shh. Okay. I like to give them a hard time. All right. Um, where does the CO2 come from? It does come from cells, but do it. Yeah. Um, what molecule does it come from? Anybody know? Um, so it comes from glucose breaking down. Glucose has six carbon atoms. You break it down into little pieces in the Krebs cycle glycolysis um, to make energy and you make a bunch of CO2 in your cell. You can't just leave it sitting there. So it's gotta go back into the blood and then get put into the alveoli and respirate it out. Is that a word? I think I just made up a word. Anyways, kind of get the point. Um, 15 minutes. All right, so we've got extra practice on there for you if you want help with ventilation or internal and external respiration. It's a good one. But I want to use our last 15 minutes to make a Venn diagram with those markers on your tables between external and internal respiration. Um, I do have new markers, so if any of your markers aren't very bright, we've got new ones this semester. I think these two tables, we'll see. Um, oh, and you want to make a big Venn diagram because you have to be able to write in it. So it should probably take up like half your table. Otherwise, you'll be able to write anything in there. Um, and these markers just come off with water and a little um, paper towel. Um, I'll tell you that diffusion only works from high to low. Gases only diffuse from high concentration to low. But you're on the right track, though, thinking about which. Well, then maybe it's how we can just put. But you're on the right. I think. Internal high. That's what it says in there. I think you're thinking about which direction the gases are moving is what you're trying to get to. Yeah, maybe So, like, is it going into or out of the blood? It's maybe what you're trying to. What you're thinking about. Yeah. What? And they're talking really about concentration. But for gases, they call it like comparative pressures. But really, it's just about it's in a higher concentration on one side of the blood than the other. So you're trying to get to. Um, so one thing you want to have on there is where, which direction oxygen's moving. Like where oxygen's moving, where CO two's moving to and from. All right, so. Quick, uh, quick overview of all that business you were just working on. Um, so ventilation is you're breathing in air from outside. Um, and then it goes to the alveoli. And in external respiration, oxygen leaves the alveoli and goes into the blood. CO2 leaves the blood and goes into the alveoli is good and then that blood that's high in oxygen goes to your tissues and delivers oxygen to the tissues so oxygen leaves the blood goes into the tissues and it picks up the waste co2 from the tissues so the co2 goes into the blood there down here and then that blood which is now does that blood have high oxygen or high co2 now high, it's high co2 so then it goes back to the lungs, so and then the CO2 leaves and it picks up more oxygen and then goes on back around. So when you're studying for those, you want to think about, you know, if you can just remember that you're breathing because you need oxygen, 
you could kind of figure out all the rest of it. Another, like you just shouldn't have to memorize all these facts. It's just kind of, well, your cells need oxygen. They get it at the lungs. Think about which way it would make sense moving. You probably have it. All right, feel good? All right, so be ready for quiz on part two on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. ATP mm -hmm. for internal. Yeah.